All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Greg Wilford, and before we get started, I want to thank our friends at the Mobile Payment Conference for inviting us in. Um, as our presenter mentioned, uh, we, we do have a fun panel for you. We think you'll enjoy this. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Greg Wilford. Um, years ago, I uh, co-founded a company that uh, became the largest community of mobile phone users in the world. We had uh, roughly 60 million registered users and connectivity uh, to mobile operators billing systems in 187 countries. So that's the start of the story, right? The, the promise of anywhere, anytime connectivity to billing, right? But the story doesn't end there. This is um, a, a, a fascinating story because um, it, uh, I, first of all, I should say that my role is not necessarily that of, of a moderator. I look at me as being more of a storyteller because, as I mentioned, the, uh, the nature of our panel is really more of a story. In fact, the, uh, the title, A Retail Fairy Tale in the Making, is exactly that, a story that's being made as we speak. And we've, um, we've asked a collection of some of the wisest folks in mobile to join us as our stories characters this afternoon. And we'll talk a little bit about the development of mobile as it relates to retail throughout, okay? Now, with any uh, mobile payment story, um, you have a, a really exciting grip, right? And the grip here is that 10, 15 years ago, if retailers had a magic wand, what would they have used it for? It would have been, I wish I could have anywhere, anytime connectivity to the folks that want to buy my stuff, right? Well, that didn't exist back then. But guess what? That magic wand really did work. And today, we have that anytime, anywhere connectivity. So with, uh, with any story, however, there always needs to be a villain, right? So the evil queen of our story here is, uh, is data breaching, OK, and misuse of, of data. There are certainly other villains involved in our story, but I did want to talk with you about some of the uh, things that are going on with regard to mobile adoption. The biggest reason why mobile adoption is not happening today as fast as we would like it is because consumers are still worried about not only their uh, information being used improperly, but also because of theft and fraud. Okay, in fact, our friends at Javelin Strategy and Research estimate that just last year alone, uh, consumers lost $16 billion to fraud, an amazing, an amazing chunk. And there was also another study done uh, that mentioned nearly half of America's adult population uh, were uh, victims of a data breach of some kind, and that was through May of 2014. So there, uh, there really is cause for concern as the bad guys out there turn their attention from online and credit cards to where the money is heading, and that's on mobile devices, okay? So um, there are some, some positive developments too, okay? The, the fact that mobile payments represent not only security, privacy, speed, but also reliability and a great user experience wherever you are, right? Because so much of what we want is an impulse, right? I want to buy this, or I love that song, let me buy it. Uh, each of our panelists will be talking about specific areas uh, of that, and uh, wanted to make, uh, let you know that it's very relevant to mention that AP Technology uh, today authored and is uh, also unveiling a mobile payments bill of rights for consumers, not just in the United States, but also globally. And what we are going to do with this uh, document is basically present it as a best uh, practices document for everyone. And it covers the most fundamental of issues from security uh, to data protection to use, right? Ease of use and also user experience. So we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along too. But the, uh, the end result is that we uh, are very excited about this panel because uh, we think that this is a story 
that has a happy ending, right? And all of us in the room here are helping to develop that. So unlike most panels that go down and introduce you know, each one in turn, what I thought I would do is, is showcase the characters of our story today and talk a little bit about how they're relevant. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> to the mobile ecosystem, okay? And um, so, Richard, if you don't mind me uh, putting you on the spot first, I, I'd like to introduce Richard Love. He's not only the CEO of AP Technology, uh, he's actually the good guy of the story because he writes my checks. <laughs> uh, but in fact, Richard is somebody who's been defining mobile payments for 26 plus years. He's a technologist. He holds several patents uh, in the technology and payments industry. And uh, way back when, if any of you are familiar with the IBM ThinkPad and some of those computers, he's the guy who designed motherboards too. So he's very much a technologist that melds that, that really interesting combination of technology with use cases, which uh, is very much relevant to our conversation today too. So um, Richard, what I'd like you to ask you is, with regard to mobile payment transactions, we have a very uh, early, stage payment happening right here. Is, is mobile transactions, are they the same kind of transactions we're gonna see maybe five years down the road? <laughs> okay, um, yeah, I get to start up by predicting the future, thanks. Hey! Uh, you know, five minutes from now is pretty hard to predict because really that's what we're all here for, right? Can you guys hear me okay? So what we're all here, here is, is to work together, share information, and kind of figure out how we produce that path and that, that best practices. You know, you mentioned it before, and panels mentioned it before, that um, you know people are not going to be using the mobile devices as much as we'd like to see, and take advantage of what can be done with the ecosystem between the merchants and the consumers, unless we get over the security fears, unless we get over the um, you know the, the concerns about data and what happens with data and who owns data and those type of things. So um, I'm going to say in five years. We've overcome those things. You know, security is, is a, a secondary function. There's trust built in, involved in the model. We do know that security is a, you know, I don't care what we come up with now, it's not gonna be the, the end game, it's an ongoing game. So, but knowing that the players, everybody who's participating is committed to, to participate and keep ahead of the, of the bad guys. Make, make the other fences shorter. You know, let them, let them go climb the other fences because uh, our fences are too hard to, to overcome. Um, and you know, mobile is not just a phone and something like this. You know, uh, mobile in the future could have all sorts of other forms. So it'll be fun to talk about that as we get into get into this a little bit later. And uh, so for me, the you know the fairy tale villain is uh, Dark Data. So <laughs> Dark Data, uh, he uh, he represents uh, a super hacker. It goes in and, and his goal is to grab everybody's data and just spread it across the universe and have it used in nefarious ways. So what, what we need to do is we need to provide products and solutions to put dark, ba dark data out of business. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Richard. You know, it'll be fun to uh, explore that a little bit more. And when we start talking about building fences and the development of products, uh, it's very much a nascent industry. And a lot of what we're discussing here is going to be the payment method of the future. And so by way of introduction, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce somebody who's been there and has been doing that for several years at some of the largest retailers in the world. Uh, we have Mario DiPrizio with us, who is not only a technologist himself, but also uh, until recently he drove uh, mobile commerce and also retail at both Sears and at Kmart. He's also been uh, with Motorola and so when we talk about uh, how to implement retail strategies and how we add that mo mobile convergence into uh, our discussion, this is somebody who we can really turn to. So uh, Mario, there are some retailers out there that still don't have a mobile initiative. They, they know about this thing called mobile, they use it maybe at Starbucks, but what's your advice to retailers that don't yet have a, a, a full-blown retail strategy? Well, I, it's a very humble advice. Uh, you know, get on with the program. 
<laughs> what do you really think? <laughs> because the, the reality is that there is no such thing as a customer who doesn't own a mobile device. Um, that are, you know, just take a, 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 a parallel. Uh, Facebook uh, has 1.7 billion people using the account. Guess how they use it? They're not at home sitting in front of a computer using Facebook. They are every corner, everywhere, using their mobile device and using Facebook. Those are the same people that are getting hints about what's running as a new product, what's up and trending, what people are looking for and buying. Uh, Facebook itself it will soon be putting, putting buy buttons on their application so that people can buy directly off of that. Not only Facebook, but everybody else, Google, everyone is going to try to do that. Mobile is where it's at. Um, not only does everyone, every retailer, uh, need a mobile strategy, it needs to be the first strategy. Uh, if, if we now design for desktop, we are designing for history. We ought to be designing for the future. The future is mobile. It's a mobile first approach. Uh, everyone should be designing the user experience as well as how easy it is to connect, transact, and navigate, it all has to be done with mobile being the first uh, point of view. Uh, everything else follows from that. And who currently owns a mobile device that is not touch screen capable? Anyone? Not, no such thing anymore. QWERTY keyboard went by the wayside. It is now all touch screen. So when you go mobile first and you design for touch screen, you guess what you have to do. Now you have to be very, very careful about uh, the user experience and how the functionality, how it works. Uh, mobile payment is an integral part of the mobile solution. Uh, what, 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 what is more frustrating than being able to find the right product, whether it's tickets to a show, whether it is a nice pair of shoes, or, or it's the last sale item that uh, you just got uh, information from one of your friends, and yes, you can locate the product, but you can't buy it. Um, How frustrating is that? Yeah, I, so what's the point? I just discovered there, now I'm, I'm super frustrated because I know the product is there, but I can't buy it. I have to go run to a store or whatever. So mobile payments are at the cross-section of what are the most useful functions on a, on a mobile device um, and very relevant to all, all retailers and anyone who wants to uh, transact. Gone are the days when we get in our cars and go over to Tower Records or Blockbuster Videos to get our get our video and our music, right? I, I can find either one of those two. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, w with uh, mobile and mobile payments changing the landscape around the world, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce somebody who is one of country music's most prolific artists. Uh, I made the mistake of asking him how many countries he's visited, and uh, he didn't know. It's um, uh, Rick Monroe is someone who has uh, visited uh, clearly more than 50, perhaps 70 countries, uh, including being the first American artist to sing the uh, American National Anthem uh, in Vietnam in, how many years was it? About 30 years. In 30 years, amazing. My first time ever singing it too. So, a little pressure. For those of you who don't know Rick Monroe yet, uh, do yourself a favor and, um, <clears throat> pardon me, check out uh, YouTube. You can also find him on Billboard's charts. He's a frequent visitor to Billboard's country music charts. And uh, aside from some of the favorites uh, of mine, uh, Midnight Rider, uh, Fires Out, uh, and your latest. What, tell us what it is. It's called Great Minds Drink Alike. I love that title. I love that. A little twist. It, it is a little twist. And what's, what's interesting ab about uh, Rick Monroe is that uh, he and I first met well over a decade ago. And it, it always amazed me what a early adopter of new technologies Rick was. He got it then, he gets it now. And the fact is, uh, it's not lost on anybody in this room, that mobile devices better connect us with our customers, right? So Rick, would you do us a favor? Tell us specifically how mobile uh, has changed the landscape for, for artists and what kind of a, uh, an opportunity does it present for you as a, as a businessman as well? That's a lot of stuff. Well, Mario was definitely you know, correct in everything saying mobile is first. Because even with us, the mobile has become 
a way that artists can connect with their fan base because with Facebook and all these things, everything's integrated into not only are you kind of marketing to them, but you're also getting to know them and you're developing that relationship. So we are still a retailer in the sense that we want to sell what we're making and the product that we have, but our ecosystem is extremely fragile that you can't give people a bad experience because then it becomes viral and people talk poorly about it. So when you do mobile, how important, and it is, I implore you guys to create more mobile applications for paying payment devices because we are an impulse buy. Music is an impulse buy. You don't need it to sustain life for food, but I mean, it's, 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 it's a wonderful thing and it's great for your emotions. But mobile and mobile payments are the kind of thing that, oh, I love that song, I wanna buy it, bang, I got it. If I told everybody, hey, get your phones out, go to iTunes, grab my song right now, you can do it. And that's, but that's something you'd be like, oh, cool, it's fun to check that out. But that's the kind of thing that we've never had that before. We had the thing where it was like, oh, I hear the song, I have to go find it, I have to go to the store, buy it, buy it. That's so many steps that a person can stop, you know, wanting to get something. Um, in a fairy tale, I guess, our villain would be the Wicked Witch of the Weight. You know, when you get the merchandise, <laughs> You know, people come up and go, oh, well, the line's too long, or I don't want to wait for that, or, you know, I'll come back later. You've lost that sale. You want people to go, man, I really love this. I want that shirt. Oh, there's the app. Boom. I bought it. I can pick it up on my way out of the concert. These are the kind of things that we want to try to integ integrate into what we do. And, um, again, with the security and um, we need the Bill of Rights that these guys are talking about, that's something that if everybody, you know, implemented, it would also give our consumers or customers you know, more security what they do. Which is important, again, because our relationship with our fans is so delicate that we want them to feel confident what they do, but yet we still want them to freely purchase what we're selling, I guess. Thanks, Rick. And as you develop strategies on how to implement mobile, mobile payments into your own retail initiatives, uh, you always look for business intelligence. Well, we are fortunate to have one of the most intelligent folks <laughs> on the planet. And what's interesting about Mr. Nick Holland is that, uh, you know, as Americans, we like to think we're on the forefront of technology and pretty much anything that exists in the world, but it's not really true when it comes to mobile. Uh, across the pond, uh, they've developed not only payment systems faster than we, but mobile technologies in general. So um, Nick uh, hails from across the pond, and uh, he has his fingers on the pulse of not only what's happening over there, but also what's happening here. So as the head of all mobile for, um, for Javelin Strategy and Research, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the, on the panel, Nick. And you know, what, are, what are you seeing that, that's coming that, that, that is reason for excitement? Is it all doom and gloom from from mobile data breaches, or is there good news? Um, I mean, first, I've got to say that this mobile thing's never going to catch on. So. <laughs> you remember that we, we, we talked about text messaging never, never coming to the United States. No, um, so what's coming? No, it's, it's certainly not all doom and gloom. We've got, you know, clearly with an increase in payment transactions, there's going to be an increased appetite for fraud. So it's kind of it's, it's always going to be there as a component. But no, I think we're we're on the cusp of something really fascinating and we're, you know, we're at such an early stage in terms of what's happening with mobile payments but um, you know as you know as we talked about here it's that it's it's not just going to be a mobile device it's going to be sort of the, the the connectivity that permeates every aspect of our lives that's um, going to be utterly fascinating you know payments is one component of that um, you know it's it's just quite staggering what what will happen as um, you start to have real-time payments capabilities on a mobile device anywhere in the world. Um, you know, we'll see some radical shake-ups of some industries. We'll see things like, uh, you know, your traditional checkout line in some scenarios go away entirely. Um, it, it's a very interesting time, and clearly there'll be winners and losers. So it's, you know, we'll see some Darwinism in action, really, as, as you know, companies do or do not make the cut. But it's uh, sure. It's going to be a fascinating time, for sure. Do you guys remember when mobile devices just did voice? <laughs> now they're doing it. There now are music players, there are cameras, there are video players. Who knows what's going to be next in terms of features? But one thing is certain, there will be a mobile payment function on there so that the fairy tale of anytime, anywhere payments can be a reality if we don't get it wrong. 
right? So what does that mean, getting it right? Uh, now that we've finished the introduction of our cast of characters here, uh, we're gonna open this up in a very interactive forum. So this is meant to be very anti-stale. Guys, when, when, you, when you, you hear something that's near and dear to your hearts, it's first one to the mic, right? So uh, I think a great way to start this off is with user experience, because we can talk about technology, we can talk about security, but the reality is we get too immersed in the minutia of this far too often. At the end of the day, it's going to be up to the user, the consumers that will end up defining the space, right? So guys, what does a, a really good payment transaction mobile need to look like? Frictionless. Yeah. I would have to say frictionless. It's something that is from, from thought to action without anything in between. Fantastic. Uh, I, I, mean, I totally agree with that. I'd say adding to that invisible, yeah. you know, that the payment process should ideally not even be a part of What's going on? I mean, you know, the, the example that's cited most often is Uber, but I think it's, it's a fabulous example. You don't know you're paying, it just happens. So it's in that, you know, make, make it as utterly seamless as possible, no friction, and it, it just happens automatically. But there still is a delicate balance because um, there are people who won't adopt technology if they don't feel like they're in control. Right. So you need to make it as seamless and as frictionless as possible, but make sure that the person who wants to have control has the control. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you know, there are examples of devices out there where they're using a fingerprint. And sure. that is how they participate in it. So it was pretty seamless, mm -hmm. but they did have control. So there there is definitely a yeah, balance. And, and to that point, which I think it's it's important to consider that it's not one size fits all either. Yeah. I mean what, what yeah. works for you know, Uber would not necessarily work for, you know, a, a Best Buy or whatever. It's not, you know, you can't sort of use a cookie cutter approach to mobile payments. Yeah. You've got to very closely examine the, you know, the, the, the requirements of, of the end user and both parts of the end user, both the merchant and the consumer. So you've got to satisfy both of those constituents. Hey, Mario, let's take this from a different angle. Uh, what doesn't work with mobile payments? I mean, you, you are not only a technologist, but you, you apply the principles of mobile payments directly to huge retailers. So what, what doesn't work and what can these folks in the audience avoid? Well, there, there, are, there are several things to avoid, several things to, uh, several traps not to fall into. One is to complicate the payment path. Uh, can you hear me okay? Um, a lot of times, um, people who design the applications, design the experience, uh, tend to put too much, um, too many steps in the payment path. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, let's ask so and so to put in the address where they want to have things shipped to. Let's ask them to put in a special PIN number. Um, should we ask them for to re-enter the credit card every time as opposed to storing? It, like like Richard was saying before, and Rick, it has to be frictionless. There is a balance in, mm -hmm. uh, in all retailers. Every, every enterprise is slightly different in terms of their appetite for uh, risk of fraud mm -hmm. and, and chargebacks, etc. So, and, and security is uh, it's a push and pull, right? Uh, the more security you add into the payment path, the more likely it is that you're adding some friction. Sure. So it's a balance between value, perceived, ease of use. So like let's, said, go to, let's go to that for a second. It's, it's not one size fits everyone. Yeah, you, so security, yeah, Nick. Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, um, it, it's interesting how, how much um, you know, our surveys indicate that the, the end user's biggest barrier to using any form of mobile payment or digital wallet, the two, top two criteria every time are security and privacy. Mm -hmm. But it's the perception of security and privacy. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily. It has to feel like you're. You know, you're. You're secure doing this because it's new and alien, and you're not necessarily going to trust it. But you. You need to feel like your hands being held. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, and the, the the bottom line is this. I mean, the, you know, the the villain of the story, as far as I'm concerned, is that if you don't nail that UX, if you don't get the experience absolutely right, that app's being deleted, and they'll just go straight back to using the wallet that they have with them anyway. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the, uh, I don't know about anybody else here, but I was so thrilled when we got to the point where 
you buy something with a credit card and you don't, don't actually have to sign. Oh, I know, absolutely. Like, wow, who figured that out? <laughs> right, right. It's, Isn't right. mobile actually more, more secure than a credit card, though? It I can mean, be a lot more secure. Yeah, I mean, general. certainly, yeah. I mean, in terms of the, um, you know, obviously Apple Pay had some issues with um, fraud recently, right. but I mean, that, that's. That was more of the loading of the card yeah. into it. That wasn't necessarily a problem with Apple. But it still was involving a card. Like well, absolutely. Well, it's, it's, it, that was, you know, sort of a little sort of chink in the armor. But certainly, the, you know, absolutely. I mean, if you're looking at the storage of credentials, things like dynamic tokenization using biometrics to actually open the device, it's, you know, it's uh, the iPhone is kind of a case study in best practice when it comes to how you should lay out mobile payments. And Richard, since you know security is really your thing too, you know, uh, is there a silver bullet, or is there just something that we need to embrace? Uh, Multi-factor authentication. What, what is it that we need to be pursuing from a, a security perspective? Yeah, certainly it's not a silver bullet, and certainly it's not um, one thing is going to solve the whole. The, the, you know, in the future, what even if we solve it today. It's going to be an ongoing. It's an ongoing process. Something you got to commit to forever. And you know, hopefully, from a merchant perspective, most of that's being solved by their their partners, the people who are providing the mobile apps, the backend payment processors, and merchant processors. And that less and less the merchant is responsible for collecting all the data, proof of purchase, and all those type of things. That we can kind of share that responsibility. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's interesting, Greg. Right now. We got a time that is totally different than we've seen. I've been in the payments industry for you know 25 years, um, and you could tell because I go to parties and no one ever wants to talk to me. <laughs> like, what do you do for living? Oh, payments, or they just keep on walking. <laughs> so, but you know now you got Bitcoin, got some other things going on. So people are interested in, in the topic, and you know it, since we've now finally embraced chip and card, chip and pin, EMV. Um, and we're switching over our, our, our devices, maybe even are going to cloud-based point of cell devices. There's a lot that is being looked at and taking place. So we could potentially even look at the paradigm shift. You know, the shift right, the, the paradigm really has been built on, you know, going from cash, where I'm pushing money to the merchant, uh, to a credit card, where I'm pushing my account information to the merchant. To, um, to whatever now. And whatever now, there's a potential that instead of actually giving the cash, giving my account number to the merchant in a token, I'm not giving my account number, I'm giving a, I'm a quasi account number. It's good for one try. Yeah. Um, but we could actually go the other direction where a merchant says, hey, I request this payment, and you do some other mm -hmm. cloud backing mechanism, and it's, it's acknowledged, you know, the, the acknowledging the, the point of sale or wherever they're done, doing that, mm -hmm. hey, I just received payment. Okay. And now it's seamless. You didn't even have to have the information because the information never even came to you. So now in some cases, the whole debate about privacy and data, that's a whole different discussion. But from the pure payment itself, you know, we can protect the data by no one sees the data. You know, it just came in completely into that. Well, it's, I mean, that, that is sort of a symptom of us being reliant on a 16-digit static exactly. number. Yeah. And that, yeah. that will go away. Not soon, but it will go away. Yeah. There's, there's ways to, you know, obviously alleviate that with things like tokenization. Um, you know, one of the things I think that is really, I think the other foot that I'm waiting to, you know, is waiting to drop is, if if you look at pretty much any payment initiative today, you're, you're loading credit cards, or you're yeah. loading yeah. gift cards, or you know, your, your debit card, or you're connecting your bank account. Mm -hmm. So it's still, you know, what we're working on here is kind of this veneer that's mobile, but you, you know, scratch the surface, and it, it's purely you know, business as usual when it comes to the payments industry. It's, it's going back to those existing rails, right? Um, I think that the, the other foot that I'm waiting for drop, to drop is there's that disintermediation that will happen at some point when you've got entities like, for example, Facebook that have entered, you know, it's, it's clear their trajectory will be towards payments. Well, why do they need the middleman? You know, it, at what point do they decide that it's, you know, they could potentially step away from that? And take the risk burden on, which is not insignificant, and actually, but but the benefit being, you know, that they they become the payment network as well as the connective tissue between those users. And you know, if you're looking at Facebook, it's typically you know connecting you and you and friends or family or whatever. But it, it might as well be a business. I mean, it, it's it's a P2P transfer, a peer-to-peer -peer transfer. It, it could well be, you know, business to consumer or consumer to business, which we use it a lot for what we Absolutely. do. I mean, that's a huge part of our, our, our yeah. whole thing between. 
Facebook, Twitter, and all those different social medias. I mean, we definitely are mm -hmm. constantly working with our, our yeah. fans or our, cons our consumers. You know, these devices do so much. Sometimes we forget that, first and foremost, they're a connection device and that we all have an innate need to communicate. And I think that if we forget that, you forget one of the strengths of, of mobile to begin with. So Mario, let me ask you, in, in, in terms of better connecting retailers you know, with, uh, with their audiences, what is the most uh, important route to follow when you're, when you're uh, in integrating mobile payments into, into your business? One of the things that um, all retailers are trying to do is personalize the experience as much as possible. Yeah. Sure. Uh, remembering who who the uh, who the, uh, the the buyer is, you know, who the member, the customer is, and and that's very useful not only for what you present to the customer, what data you present, what prior history, uh, but it also plays well into some of the best practices that were mentioned before in terms of how to improve security. So remembering IP addresses, remembering devices IDs, being able to cross-correlate uh, a loyalty ID with a device ID in previously stored payment information. So now we know that that particular credit card, my credit card, mm. is one that is trustworthy because I'm using it on a device that you recognize the device ID. It's Mario's device. It's Mario's loyalty number. So this one probably doesn't need to go through the ringer from a fraud analysis point of view. It's probably a li very likely a good. Uh, so those are the kinds of uh, deep analysis that uh, everyone should go through, retailers particularly, to identify what are the mechanisms to get a lot more frictionless payments. Mm -hmm. That would be a very frictionless payment if you recognize my ID, my loyalty number, because I logged in into the app. And you know Mario's purchasing, he just bought this morning, he bought yesterday. This transaction flies right through with a single click. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of things that you uh, want to do as a... I'd like to add on to that as well, Mario. I mean, we, we, we're talking, I mean, obviously your, your presence or his, historically has been very much in terms of bricks and mortar retail experiences, right? And, yeah, and yeah, obviously yeah, that's yeah. that been the growth in right. mobile commerce and Rick as well, you know, we were about yeah. selling at events right. as well as obviously digital content. But, you know, the, the lady from ACI mentioned uh, the, you know, the growth in time not present fraud. And I actually wanted mm -hmm. just to mention um, our own angle on that is it's going to grow, grow irrespective of EMV, right? It's not, it's not because of EMV, it's going to happen anyway. But we know how much card not present fraud in, in the online space is going to, going to grow. And I think one of the, the attributes around mobile is that it's, it could be a far more robust form of authentication for online transactions. Yes. And, and, you know, that, that is something to explore as well. I mean, it's, as I say, I mean, we're, we, we're stuck with this you know, de facto payment mechanism that's, you know, the, the 60 digit card number. Yeah. And it, it's, it's just, uh, it, it's obviously, it's, it's a, you know, legacy of that was what was available when e-commerce started. But it's, it's totally right for replacement and mobile is going to be yeah, that device. Yeah. yeah, and when we talk about, um, you know, a mobile device and what it could bring to the table, it, you know, it really is a great participant in layered security. Yes. You know, you know that device. It's got an ID. It's unique. It's, it's actually got some secure memory that uh, is mm -hmm. controlled by OS level. Right. You, it's, it's got, you know, fingerprints in the old days. If we wanted to authenticate with a fingerprint, that data would go across the wire to some server somewhere, which would, you know, validate the data and then send it back. Well. Yeah, you know, man in the middle attack, somebody sits in the middle. Once they got that data, that, sure. that data is the data. Mm -hmm. So now you're authenticating just to the device mm -hmm. itself, which right. now, so that's a layer at the device level. Now the application can log into a sure. server and authenticate there. You know, there's, you know, it just keeps going. And sure. so by layering security, we can make it much, much more difficult, make that fence much higher. For, for the criminals where they'd rather go back up and chase out I mean, the plastic the, again. The, the, the one problem being, or one, I mean, many problems in this, but <laughs> I think one of, one of the most fundamental problems around the payments industry is that, you know, clearly mobile personal computer devices, whatever they are, you know, your phones, your tablets, your wearables, whatever, yeah. that's evolving very, very fast. But, but we're, we're handcuffed to this legacy system yeah. right, of, yeah. you know, existing payment rails and the, the payment networks underneath are loath to change anything in a lot of respects because 
you know, if it works, don't fix it, has always been the mantra. And, yes. and, and they're terrified of, of a couple of things. One is, you know, they, they tweak something and it doesn't, you know, it just explodes. Or, or, or they tweak something and it completely opens the market up to, you know, them being displaced. So, you know, it's, it's sort of, we're in this kind of holding pattern while, while payment innovation is somewhat being, I, I don't know, it's going to happen, obviously, right. but we, we, we're kind of stuck in this two-horse race with, you know, hair and tortoise. Yeah, we don't need to force people to use credit. No. No, we have, you know, you know, credit is great for someone who wants to pay in the future. You know, prepaid cards is the other direction where right. I'm investing money yeah. early, but uh, at least I know it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got the things in between, kind of the ECHs sure. or the old checking and uh, checking mechanism, which is a little bit more almost now. You know, yeah. and ACH is working towards real-time payments or at least same-day payments. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see more and more ability for those types of payments to be part of the, the mobile sure. device. As a matter of fact. I think the check's got a second life without it being a piece of paper. I mean, the, the whole remote right. deposit capture right. has actually, certainly has yeah. enabled yeah. checks yeah. to live on a lot longer. Um, certainly, I mean, it's, fundamentally it comes down to, you know, there's three ways to pay, right? There's uh, before, now, or later, yeah. right? Yeah. And that, that's it, that's all it comes down to, that, that's it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, if mobile can do any one of those better, then it's gonna maybe displace the incumbents. But, that will not be something that happens quickly, unfortunately. Yeah, and one size doesn't fit all. And, and for anybody who's a retailer, I mean, what what their biggest challenge is is that you've got you know all these different payment mechanisms. So great, they're available, and there's all these mechanisms. How do I integrate or handle all those? And I think there's right. really a, a tier in between there that needs to show up, show up at the table, and say, you know, work with us. We'll make sure that you have and you have the ability to to take all the different payment mechanisms per your rules, whatever those rules are, so that your, your preferences and, and, and all that type of stuff. So, um, certainly a challenge. Okay guys, I wanna take a, a little different uh, tact here with regard to data. Okay, so uh, my take and my experience has been that with regard to use of, uh, of personal data, there's the yin and the yang. On the, on, the, on the bad side, you've got abuses of data would turn a pristine environment that we know on our mobile fo phones into spam central, right? We might even uh, get a do not call service just for uh, the ability to keep solicitors away from our from away from our device devices excuse me but on the on the plus side isn't it a wonderful opportunity to be able to use that data to present a personalized experience for customers based on their needs does it have to be a permission based environment or is it is it simply a beacon where you know you're within you know arm's reach of somebody if they can't outreach outrun you you're going to deliver something to them yeah. <laughs> you know that's, I mean, no, I mean, that, that's that's I mean, that's a fascinating point in that you know there's there's clearly you know we've we've already seen the poisoning of some channels right and absolutely that is forever poisoned by spamming yeah. uh, you can't undo that and it's going to be extremely difficult not to poison. The, the mobile channel with you know a badly thought out campaign. So I don't know. It's it's clearly you know it's a tightrope to walk this in terms of how the industry will evolve and, and not you know basically crap on their own doorstep. Uh, but it, it's also <laughs> interesting. Yeah, an interesting analogy. Uh, <laughs> but no, I mean it, it's um it, it's it's also I mean the, I think the the way things are being turned up very gradually in some respects you know the kind of the big back another and as you boil in the frog right so I think that's that's some that's already happening with things like mobile marketing and promotions and sure and just the, the availability of information I think you know the um, I've got an Android phone I, I like Google now I use that a lot it's been starting to become very intuitive about me and what I would like to know about it's. So it's, it's a trade-off, and again, it, it's not going to be one size fits all from an end user standpoint. I mean, my, I, I happen to be, you know, obviously a bit of a technologist. Um, a lot of people will not like that. It'll be seen as invasive, but uh, I, you know, I, I think hopefully the industry will not, like we say, poison the well. I think it's very better. Well, Mario, and Rick, is, uh, yeah. You know, as always, there's a balance between what uh, regulations may require, may mandate, and particularly for retailers, you know, it's very important to uh, stick to the regulations when it comes to campaigning via email or text messaging or whatever, and which varies by state, so you have to be very careful with that. But uh, customers 
customers feel like they need to be in somewhat of control of when they choose to be having data pushed to them or data collected from them. Sure. Uh, pushing data is obviously people want to avoid spam and mm -hmm. they don't want to have an email every 15 minutes telling them that there's a sale. Uh, but also when collecting data, I, I think people don't mind so much the data collection if they see a direct benefit mm -hmm. to them. And I think where a lot of enterprises miss the opportunity is to collect the data with permission or whichever mechanism is necessary mm -hmm. in the case, but actually providing a value add to the, to the user. And when that happens, people are willing to part with data so that they can actually get something in return. The, the problem becomes when all we're trying to do is get the data to shove more information and try to sell you more product, and you're really not getting anything different than what you would normally get through spamming of email. So I think, I mean, the key word here is specificity. Specificity, right? correct. So, Rick, I mean, it, it's got to be an awesome thing for you to, to utilize technology to connect you with audiences, but, you know, it, it's got to be something that they want, right? Well, yeah, definitely, because the thing is, again, with all the social media, we get a direct connect now with fans, and in that, which, again, you want to be able to, the more information you have about them is also nice from the fact of what you're going to provide for them, whether it be the next single you want to put out, what kind of merchandise you want to make for them, so, you know, definitely we'd love to get the information, but we also want to make sure that we're, we're good stewards of that information, which it kind of goes back to what you guys have, uh, your Bill of Rights. The, the Bill of Rights, it comes back to, as long as the, the companies are good stewards of that information, yeah, I don't think people mind, because, because you want to, and with us especially, nowadays, it used to be that an artist was this kind of ethereal guy that you'd see a picture of and that's it, and they go see him live. Now we are so integrated with our fan base and they demand that you are. Mm -hmm. They want you to be available for them on everything that they write and post. And so that information has to come back and benefit us. Mm -hmm. So that's, what we're, that's where we do use that. I've got, I've got to say, is I'm very impressed by, again, you, you're, you know, you're, you're so analog as a musician, right? <laughs> but, also, but, but also you're so digital as well. You're such a contradiction. <laughs> and it hurts walking around sometimes. I know. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, we're coming to the end of our session, but before I let you go and before we do a, a Q&A for anybody that has questions, um, this is a, a fairy tale, right? So I want to make sure that each of you gets a complimentary magic wand mm -hmm. to use. Yeah, yeah, I knew you'd like that. So yeah, I've got a selfie stick already. <laughs> each of you bring such a wonderful perspective to mobile payments and to retail. Uh, Richard, I'm going to start down with you. We'll come this way. You've got your magic wand. You can change the mobile landscape and the retail and mobile payment landscape in any way you choose. Go. Well, I, I get to use the words we always used earlier. It's got to be frictionless. It's got to be um, not just physically and real secure, but it's got to get make sure that people feel like it's it's secure. And um, it's going to be really fun in the future. That you know, I envision you know there there's uh, there's companies out there that can use uh, your pulse as as a, a biometric. So now you got the watches. You can keep the pulse. So you're actually logging in by just wearing this watch. It identifies you as a unique user. And then your finger is a 3D pointer, so now you, you know, there's your cursor, you can do a 3D dimensional login. So I think security could be really, really fun with some of these new, uh, uh, new biometric and, and new uh, uh, wearable devices. So yeah. Poof! That's my Damn. magic wand. All right. Thank you. Hey, all the mobile stuff is great. I just wish the phones would actually make calls. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is awesome. I can do everything on it, but, you know, um, I, you know, I, I keep going to drive it home. The frictionless transaction. I want, I want to have something that a person can be sitting there watching a show, going, love this, be able to connect through all the different, like a, a kind of a single go-to spot where they could connect with what we're doing, get some special stuff by doing that, buy things right away, leave the show, have something, not have to wait in line, and just that great experience, and then be able to keep growing on that. Terrific, Mario. Yeah, I, my magic wand is. Um, uh, for all intents and purposes, this device is always mine. It's, on, it's always with me. There's no way to leave it anywhere behind. Uh, as I'm going through the journey of finding the product or the ticket or the piece of music or the book or anything, um, is to, as I'm going through the flow, to basically just get to the point where you say, well, thank you very much. You have just acquired that product and um, payment is complete. Yeah. Just 
that intuitive, that easy, you know. It sounds like a happy ending to me. <laughs> All right, Mr. Nick Holland, okay. um, your magic wand, please. Thanks, all right, so it's got to be a payments magic wand. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I was getting, if I had one wish, it may be for Donald Trump's larynx, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I would suggest, um, I'm just thinking about Donald Trump's larynx there. No, um, I, I would think, I mean, uh, echoing, obviously, frictionless, so on. I, I, I think if, if I could wave a magic wand, I would like, um, I would like mobile payments or the, the mobile ecosystem to get to a point where it can very predictively tell me things I would want to purchase uh, in a way that doesn't feel intrusive, doesn't feel like spam and might actually be, I would say, you know, broadening my, my you know, oh, taste of the world. It might be you, you like this kind of thing, maybe you'd like to try that. I mean, I want back to music, one of the most magical mobile uh, experiences I find it uh, some of the, the apps like you know last FM or Spotify oh or, those are great yeah. in so terms stuff of you've never no, absolutely of. and you know they're, they're, they're intelligently listening to you know what what you like and, and making very sort of predictive uh, and actually very accurate uh, assessments of what I might also want to hear so I love that and I, again you know if, if that could be brought it to bear in the retail domain that would be fabulous for me Fantastic. Well, regardless of, of what industry you're in, one thing is very clear. We're not talking about millions of dollars here. We're not talking about billions of dollars. We're talking about a global landscape where trillions of dollars are being processed and being transacted on mobile devices. So it, we are all uh, thrilled about the, the developments happening. And uh, thanks to these magic wands, we have a real opportunity to make things happen here. So. So uh, now you all have magic wands in the audience. So we're going to turn this over to you with, uh, with the uh, fact that you've got some, some very knowledgeable folks up here. Do we have any, any questions out in the audience? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, I'm wondering what the panel thinks would be the hook for consumers to have more interest in payments and payment technology. Uh, Richard mentioned that the people run away from the dinner starts talking about payments or they know you might. Um, I've been in situations where um, I'm talking about Apple Pay on my phone and, and the woman next to me says, what's that? And I go, do you have a new iPhone? She says, yes. I go, well, you have it too. She goes, are you kidding me? And I have to show her where Apple Pay is. They don't know what it is. And the same thing goes on for chip cards. Don't you know, you've got chip cards in your wallet, you don't even know what you have. Yeah, it's funny. I'm already, I'm already hearing stories about people saying, I can't get the silver sticker off my new car. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's a PR campaign. I'm not kidding you. It's, 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 it's not as simple as, hey, I love that new song. I, got, I, know, I know what I like in my music. But it goes back to the, to, to the experience. So you can go into a restaurant, and if you have a good experience, you're going to tell... 10 people, right? And they'll tell 10 people. And that's how the, the, the word will spread and more people will, will, will utilize mobile payments. On the flip side of that, if we don't do what we've been talking about up here, if there is no mobile payment bill of rights that says consumers have the right to fill in the blank, then we run the risk of a poor user experience. And Rick, what happens if you go into a restaurant and have a, have a bad experience? You don't go back and you tell everybody about it. There's no there's nothing you can do to get that person back in here. So I think it's it's uh, on everybody's shoulders here in this room to make sure that we get it right, to make sure that we're good ambassadors of data, to make sure that it's a frictionless transaction, and to make sure that the, the experience is something that people want to do, something that's easy to do, and something that's ubiquitous. So if I go one place, I can use the, the same uh, mobile payment system as if I'm going across the street and, and shopping elsewhere. Yes, sir. I, I was just going to comment on kind of what you guys were talking about earlier. For me personally, I mean, over the past six months, you know, practicing chip and dip and then hitting the, the Google wallet, to me it's, it's seven seconds versus three seconds. Right, yeah. It, it's and that's down to the UX again, it's like that frictionless payment and make it simple. And that's, I mean, it's going to get even more straightforward, right, with the, you know, as, as Android pay rolls out, where you just, you don't even have to open the app. So, you know, it's, it's pretty close. But what? It's kind of like, you know, when, when debit came out, right? So we had credit yeah. and everybody knew how to swipe it and then this debit came out and it's like, 
what is that person doing? <laughs> no, I mean, I mean honestly, the, yeah. if you look at the adoption curves there, yeah. it wasn't overnight for any of yeah. that. So, uh, so part of it is, is that everybody who uses a mobile device to pay in a line in a store is a salesperson for mobile devices. Because anybody standing there is going to say, well, how did that happen so quickly? What, you know, what was that? Or how come they got 20% off on a coupon? And they didn't pull in coupons out of their purse. What happened? You know, so it'll become a must-have. Some of those experiences will come up, but it does take a little while. Yeah. So, uh, in closing, guys, I want to thank everybody on the panel. Uh, we certainly don't want any boiled frogs, <laughs> but what we do want is a happy ending, a fair tale come true. And I think we're there, guys. So, um, are there any more questions before we? Well, it's, it's the experience of obviously if you're in a show and you want to buy something, you don't want to wait in line, you can actually look it up, you know, for the for the event, mm -hmm. hit, hit the pay button, pay it right there just as you buy it and walk out and it'll, be, it'll already be set up for you. Because if, you, if you've ever been to a concert and seen a merch person just freaking out because there's this huge long line and they're taking cash from one, they're taking a credit card from somebody else, they're trying to do all this stuff. If it was all set up like that, literally it'd just be a nice little package waiting for you on your way out the door. Mm -hmm. So you just set it up, they go, great, love that shirt. And, and of course, once they walk up to get the shirt and the koozie they want, they're like, oh, I didn't see that hat. I'm going to, you know, and then you might get that extra sale. But at least you can make a nice experience. So then plus the person doesn't have to worry about bringing extra money to the concert. They have to deal with it and go, they can go buy their beer and booze instead. Um, so just that's kind of the app to, to run it through to make streamline that. If I can wrap up uh, w with one recurring theme amongst all of our panelists, and I think Mario did a great job of saying it, uh, and, and uh, so did you, Nick, is if you don't have a mobile initiative, get it, right? The, the days of going into a brick and mortar uh, and relying on that for your sales is done. The future of payments is certainly mobile. So whatever you do, get that mobile initiative, make it. Uh, priority number one. Is that right, Mario? Priority number one, mobile. Great. First. <laughs> Fantastic. You guys, please uh, thank our, our panelists, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.